Good evening and welcome to this first gathering of Unveiling the Mysteries of God. <clears throat> For those of you who don't know me, I'm Robbie M. Turbini. You have Rene here and a few other wonderful people. Everybody say hi so we can hear you here. Hi. 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 And <clears throat> this is about introducing people, many people around the world, who have been going to church for years and have had many questions and they're not answered. From this evening, we're going to begin to examine those questions and bring you the answers as best as we could. But first, we'll begin with prayer. Let us all pray. Hold hands with somebody next to you if it's possible. Heavenly gracious Father, Lord, as we come in your holy presence, we sing hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. As I stand, O oh God, before your throne, I join the saints in singing holy, holy, holy. Worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lamb which was and is and is to come. Glory, glory, glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We give you glory and praise. We pray, O oh God, as we start this new year from even today, the day before, that you guide us and lead us in your will and your way, that your name may be lifted up, O oh God, your name may be glorified, and you bring your people into that truth and that mystery that you want them to learn. The days of milk is over. Let us take them, O oh God, to the time of meat and bones, revealing and unveiling the mysteries and the secrets hidden in the word. We'll take them, O oh God, from the milk to the metaphoric language and the allegoric language written in the word to reveal your power and your glory. Lord, as we look forward to the new year, we bind and rebuke the enemy. We bind and rebuke the canker worm. And O oh God, all blight and financial distress. And we open your windows in heaven, O oh God, and we come out a blessing upon your people yes, against all odds, and we call it yes, done. Jesus. For such is your power. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen.
at this point, I think it's good to start this wonderful evening with the reason we are gathered here. And I will share to some of you who are listening that thing is going to fall. You got to hold it. Keep your hands up. The reason we are here this evening is not because I wanted to be involved in ministry, but because God has been doing spectacular things a couple months now. For those of you who have met me a couple months ago, it started a few years ago. I was testing it. And you all are here because most of you have experienced something supernatural in your life. You have seen something, heard of something. So we want to start with one testimony, and then we have a song, and a testimony and a song. Who will be the first? Did you have an experience that you witnessed here? Or you can share that. This is Brother Rennie. He will introduce himself and share his experience. My name is Renil Broderick. Um, I'll get to know Pastor about, say, early about two weeks ago, three or four weeks ago. I met him once. I came with my nephew, Jeremy. We just passed in and checked his mom and his sister and his dad. He was helping Pastor around the house. And I came a second time under different circumstances. We came to hunt. Look for money too, why you want or something. And we had a, a, a little conversation from 11 o'clock to almost half past one the next morning. And really didn't want to leave because it was really interesting knowing and understanding the power of God and what it is in you and how it lies in you. And strangely, it was a couple days, it was Christmas Day, yes, Christmas Day. We were all around and we were helping pastor trying to get the place set up and whatsoever. And lo and behold, I was using a power washer and pastor ball out, where is he gone? Where is he gone? The gun was on top of the table in the sack. I felt a gun right really to, to the to people who don't know what I'm talking about, right? And um, lo and behold, I was stealing him, trying to see what he wanted to shoot. And there was this beautiful little door. And I said, Pastor, what are you going to do? He said, that thing destroyed me, I'm going to kill it. I said, no, I beg for the dog. He said, no, I have to wound it. I said, no, don't shoot the animals. And he still fired off the gun, and the dog gets hit in the left leg. And you know, I feel kind of upset because I love dogs. I have five home. I treat them like kids. And it was boxing evening, day evening. We now prepare food. I now roast two fish over a fire. And I was taking out the fire and I end up throwing one of the lightning stick behind one of them cats in the yard. And the pastor was saying, oh, you go burn down the bush, you go burn down the bush. And lo and behold, Mark went, brother Mark, he went to see where the fire was. And there he went, he said, come see something. And when we went, there was the same dog pastor shot, lying in the grass and peeing. The dog didn't want to get up, lying, and what she was waggling her tail. So me and Mark come, we take the food, we take the duck, curry duck, it had curry duck and roti, and some stuff, and we fill our bowl with water, and we went and we gave the dog. She was lying and eating the food. She didn't on her foot, she was just lying there. And lo and behold, not even... Say less than two minutes, the dog, less than two minutes, the dog ran from down the hill and come jumping and playing in the yard. So all of us now say, wait now, what went on there? And pastor just look us and smile, not knowing what he did. So just Celeste is coming, my pretty little niece is coming to share the second half of this testimony. So, 
after he left the dog down the hill and all he did was come back up the hill and saw the dog wagging his tail like nothing had happened but within that time frame all pastor did was after getting fed up with her and everybody accused him of shooting the dog and all of that he looked at the dog and he just said you all are forgiven that's all he said and within seconds the dog comes up the hill like as soon as he says it, it just walks up the hill. So you see the dog. He started off with a limp in the same leg that he got shot in. Then within seconds again, it, it eased off. And then seconds again later, the dog is just jumping around like normal. Like nothing happened at all. So when he walked in now, he was like, the dog must be playing the fool. Or it was just playing. I said, no, Pastor, forgive the dog. And that's all he did. He just said, you all are forgiven. And that was it. The dog was good like nothing had happened. Will you examine the dog? Yes. Did you examine the dog to be certain that that is the same dog you saw that could move? Yes. Did you check to see if the dog had the wounds from the gun? Yes, the pellet went down on the outside of her left leg and it was swollen on the inside where the pellet was touched. It did not pass through. There was a big red bump. So, without a shot of a dog, you knew the dog could not move because the dog would run for the food and then the dog was eating. Yes. Can you explain in your words how that happened? My explanation is the divine, well, the power of God. Manifested. What were you discussing all day that day? Something yes. I can do what? I can do all things to Christ who strengthened me. Well, that was our discussion Christmas Day. We had a, a lengthy discussion, probably about an hour and a half. Three, four of us all sit down and, and we were discussing. And not, not long after, we were discussing that. We see that the power of God manifests through I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. Interesting. Now, this just goes to show, and the lesson in this is not really about the healing of the dog. That is just the side effect of the power of forgiveness. When God forgives you, just like that dog, every single thing is done away. Your sickness, your pain, your infirmity, and everything negative is washed clean. You all have a dog to examine and lighten the story with, but it's much, much bigger than that. And for those who have found Christ and have found forgiveness, that is your life. Everything is forgotten by God in the physical and the spiritual sense. We have our next song, and then we're gonna have somebody else share their experience. A nice lively song to, to, to bring us into the new year. Somebody else who have a testimony that they might want to share oh, is. No. Would you like to go first? No, they fell in the back. All right. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to limit the testimonies tonight to just about two or three, and then we're going to go into the most important aspect of today being old years and how we're going to tackle the new year. 
and this is Sister Asha Mangru. And I was set up by a very, very good friend and pastor friend of mine, Pastor Gajram Singh. <laughs> that setting up led me to come and meet half a few wonderful people. And this young lady is one of them. Can you share your experience of one of your testimonies, which you might think is the most powerful one? One of the few. One of the few. Yeah. I'll be sure. Um, at church, he was praying for me and my family, and I was very depressed. And after he prayed for me, I just felt like the love of God just wrapped around me, and I felt that peace. But I did not tell him about myself, my personal health. I had a uh, spine injury, my spine was twisted three places, and um, I had two spine surgery, and um, I couldn't balance proper to stand or anything, I had to use a stick for a while. But while standing there, um, I was trusting God, Lord, I want, uh, we would say, a miracle to happen. And while standing, I just felt my toes, because my, to my toes to balance, I had to curl up the toes mm -hmm. to get a proper balance. I just felt my toes just shoot off and have flash like that. And my foot is a foot size bigger than it was. So I can balance proper. Mm -hmm. And recently I've been feeling my spine shrink now because I feel like it's in taller. Remember yeah. the twist in the spine. So I feel like I'm my wow. back is shrinking and um, the spine is feeling a lot better. And um You can tell about the, the, the feeling restored. Okay. Uh, from the waist to the back go down to behind the knees, I had no feelings at all. Uh, that was for 14 years because of my first spine surgery. And um, that was another miracle. I would say we would call it a miracle for now. I was sitting on the bed where the sun shines or it hits. And that is my habit every morning to sit in the sun. And this morning I sat down and I felt the heat. So I got up back, I said, Nana. Uh, to make it sure, I sat down again, and then there it was, I felt burned again. So for 14 years, for the first time, I had feelings from my waist go down. I can feel hot, cold, wet, or dry. Mm -hmm. And that is my testimony for Thank now. Thank you. No, don't move. You can give the Lord a hand, please. <laughs> now, Coming from the background where I introduced computers to Pinal and, and, and trying to analyze things, there's something called the placebo effect that some of you might be aware of. Some people are sick mentally or psychologically. According to some doctors, 40% of the patients they receive are what you might call placebo patients. They're not really sick. Now, what evidence you have to say that one your i'm just asking you to verify whether it qualifies as a supernatural healing or miracle and whenever we go to church we have a lot of people stand up and testifying and we have to ask is it real did it really happen or was it a psychological thing a placebo effect because too many times in the churches all over the world not just in trinidad we have a lot of people who are really just sick in the head they are psychologically ill, not necessarily ill. And I never wanted to come into ministry because I thought most of the Christians are, are what you call either delusional, if not some are lunatics. So I tell the Lord, if you want me to go in ministry, make sure you give me at least three gifts that I can't explain or disprove. Whether it's biologically, psychologically, physically, metaphysically, anyhow. So we just want to verify now whether he really had a miracle. Forget the dog, that's, that's different. He, he can't, she can't testify for herself. But we have hunters who can verify that. Now, when you had the surgery, what happened? Your foot closing like this. My foot had no strength and I had no so proper So you closing it to, to so the balance. balance. And... That healing, did it happen over a period of time or instantaneous? That one happened instant. Okay. Now, that evening I visited you the day before and I said, I'm forgetting something. 
And I was looking to see what I left at your house. You remember that? Yes. And there was nothing there, but we could see with a physical eye. And is it the very next day you received that feeling where you start to feel the heat in your legs? Yes, I believe so. Yes. Now, are you sure now, for 14 years, you could not feel hot or cool? Positive. Do you have evidence to support that? Yes, doctors proof. <laughs> okay, you have your children and stuff. We just, you see the thing with miracles, a lot of us, and, and the reason we're going to examine these things, even though it's happening, a lot of people in church who want to run and say we have a miracle. Because they want to be recognized. The things of God, you don't want to be recognized. You want it to prove themselves, to stand against the test. If you are to follow the Bible, it says, test all things. Try it as gold, try it as fire. Some of the churches, if you only test it, they call you, um, in fact, if you ask them questions, they say you are doing witchcraft. If you ask a pastor, did that person really get healed? They say you shouldn't question God. And, and some who will be watching this will realize that when some people say 80% of the Pentecostal church are crook, they might not be far off from the actual truth. Because some of them appears to be that way. It may or may not be so. Because they take things without verifying and run with it and then afterwards they say, so tell me something, are you still feeling the, the result of that healing? Yes. And is it after that your spine started straightening? Yes. Were you told to do certain things that you follow that cause this effect? Okay, one of the things I was told to do was love yourself. Look in the mirror and tell yourself that you love yourself, appreciate yourself for who you are. And um, I believe that is what started a lot of yes. stuff in the healing process. Believing in yourself, loving yourself for who you are. Now, some of the things we're going to be dealing with in later publications is how your thoughts affect the world around you. And those of you who can't wait, look up Dr. Masuro's water experiment or the double slit experiment, where you will understand that your thoughts can change the molecular structure of water. And your body is 70 to 90 percent water. So your thoughts and what she was asked to do is to look at yourself and tell the molecular structure of your body that I love you. And that changes, that heals the molecular structure. And when I tell people healing is not a miracle, they look at me like, that's say you nuts. Why are you totally crazy? When you understand the principles that God set down, healing is not a miracle, but healing is the children's bread. But the church has forgotten these truths. So when somebody come and tell me, I just watch him and smile and everybody look at me like, why isn't he excited? I'm not excited because you just had some bread. That's your food. That's that's just how it is. And 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 this is the reason why, for those of you who know me, rather having a drink of rum or anything else, it's because I'm forced into the ministry because of these things. Because the church is lacking, and God, so okay, I need you to help me. So you show sure you're healed. Now, we're going to talk about faith later and how it works. And I will want you to explain to us and some people how sometimes God answers prayers for some people, in your case, immediately. And as we're on the topic one time, now this is a different service because it's not the normal flow. So God answer how many prayers and miracles you had answered? You lost count. But there's still one or two that's that's waiting. Yes. And do you understand why?
you need to speak loud. They can't hear you. So we have somebody else I want to I want to share just for after a song. Mr. Johnny. Without him, most of this work in preparing this place would not have been accomplished. And I want to thank him publicly. I want to thank all of you. I want to thank everybody involved. Johnny, his wife, his kids. Thank you, sister, for the curtains. All these things is done because I told the Lord, I said, Lord, listen, if you want this work done, you do it yourself. I said, some of you will say, this man has talked real managed to God. this is not my work. This is his work. We had a deal. And by listening to people later on, on their experience, you'll realize it's a very weird situation. And by listening to people later on, oh boy, on their experience, you'll realize it's a very weird situation. Right, there we go. First time, so we're going to have some hiccups as everything in life. And Johnny is going to tell you how he who don't like church. And those of you who know him on the outside, he still probably might not strike you as a churchy person. But he's going to get there. As we'll be discussing later on, the will of God in your life. How does it work? We'll discuss some of that tonight. So Johnny, how did you end up in church and working so hard for God? Well... One morning, praying that, you know, that praying for certain things, and every time I go to church, go up for prayer, it's like pastors keep praying for one thing over and over. Just keep praying, like almost the prayer, same prayer over and over. So, so I get up that morning, so well, if I go to church this morning, they can pray for me, the same prayer, I know going back. But I have to go back to church and uh, go up for prayer or anything. I just wasted my time. So, went to church that morning. Went up for prayer as normal. But looking at Mr. Robbie there, you know, and see he praying for one person today. And that's what a long process of praying for that one person. Because he and she were like a short prayer, just keep praying for them and talking to them. And our pastor, she just prayed for everybody beside of me, after me, and she, she just said, I'm leaving. She leave him out. <laughs> she leave me out. So, yeah, she said, did you pray for him? She said, um, she said, no. So, he came in front of me and asked me, well, how was, how, how, how was, how are, how are you? So, all right. Said, don't lie. How are you? And I said, well, not all right. <laughs> then, he, then he started praying with me. So from then, well, after I came down by him, he said he wanted to start a church. So that's from there, uh, that's where I was I think, I think I, if I remember correctly, it, it went something like this. I goes, how are you? And he said, fine. I goes, okay, listen to me carefully. I'm going to ask you this one more time. How are you? Is that more accurate? That's right. And then he said, well, not so fine. I was okay. That's much better. 
And do you remember exactly what happened after that? You don't have to say the details of it. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, and, um, Was there any secrets here? Uh, yeah. I said, tell me I have an organ wife. <laughs> I said, don't go down that road. <laughs> let, let, let me help this thing along. <laughs> <laughs> well, what it is is that Johnny has a very, very colorful life for those of you who know him. And many of us have colorful lives. I had a colorful life, very colorful, some of you will know. And sometimes we have to understand that these are things that must be fulfilled. And Johnny was fulfilling the path for that period of his life. And he wanted to know if God is real when he came up. So what the Lord did was use me as an instrument to tell him about his life and what's going on. And we can safely say there was no secret hit that day. And that is what I think changed Johnny. Is that fair to say? And a man who would rather be drinking, spend more hours helping prepare this place as you see today. And a lot of people have to understand in Christ when you come in Christ, and when Christ comes in you, if you are born of the Spirit, something happens. And this is lacking in the churches today. It is said that there is therefore now no condemnation. Anybody can help me with that? To those that are? So, if you become a Christian and Christ comes in you and you in him the first things happen to you and people think it means you are not condemned that's because it seems apparently a lot of us lack the understanding of the English language because it means there's no condemnation in you for no one else and this is a very very serious serious matter in the lives of Christians because under the present system we are programmed to hate and to condemn in the church and as we will study this in detail in later meetings we will understand it's a form of management governments use it it's called divide and conquer Politicians use it, in Trinidad especially, divide and conquer the blacks against the Indian, the Indian and blacks against the Chinese and the Syrian. And while you're busy condemning each other, they can manipulate you and control you. And any good manager in a company knows how to do that as well. Those of us who work in a company, we know and we see sometimes how the bosses actually put you against each other. Sometimes in a good way where they create competition, but sometimes in a bad way, where they encourage snitches and backbiters. And while you're thinking you're doing a good, you're just being programmed and played. And this is very active in the church as well. We are all supposed to be the body of Christ and you go to church and in many churches, not all thankfully, hopefully, you find churches keep condemning each other. We that are in Christ will not judge or condemn anyone. You that are here will not judge or condemn any church or anyone because they are only struggling just like you to find their way home. We may know more, but that does not entitle us to condemn anyone to hell or to damnation. Because if you put on the mind of Christ, he said, forgive your brother, 70 plus 7 in one day. Now that's an awful lot. You know, so we have to understand these basic teachings of Christ. If we want to be, and, and this is one of the reasons for this ministry. So Johnny, can you tell us, as a, we are all your friends here. Do you think God is beginning a work in you? Yes. Is it changing your life? So far. You're looking better. Let's, let's have a nice song as we move to the next one. Let's give God glory and praise.
Give Johnny a round, please, because without him, we just don't have to talk. I love that song. going to get into the meat of the matter. Time is going to run out with us pretty quick when we start. I think somebody had some questions. Now this is going to be a ministry where we don't preach, but we are brave enough to ask you to ask the questions, the hard questions, so that you might learn. And one of the things I believe while growing up in church Especially with one of the most difficult topics is about offerings and tithes, brother. And you know when you're having your, you're not in church and you backside as they call it, that's always an interesting topic. And we came to the conclusion that after you look at it from every angle, a workman is only worthy of his wages if he can deliver it. In my opinion, if a pastor stands up there or sits up here and he cannot deliver, he haven't earned his salary, he's not worth it. So somebody asked me a topic recently about, uh, is that Nadine? Did you ask me about tithes and offering? That's my opinion on the matter. A lot of preachers are going to be angry with me for this. But if you cannot earn your salary, you're not worth it. So if I cannot earn my salary, you should not give me any offering. Give it to the widow and the fatherless and the hungry and the poor. You might quicker get a blessing. Because sometimes when you look around today in the church industry, not necessarily the church of God, anyone can see that many of the men and women in the church is just in it for the money but they cannot deliver, they haven't earned it. They use psychology, they use petty parlor tricks and tell you it's from God. And this thing is not good, it must stop. But we the people have to stop it. Because we the people, because we are searching, we are gullible. We want answers and there are millions of people hungry and they will believe anything. They just want to find something or somewhere to worship and to believe. And this is the terrible part where people take advantage of them in the ministry. But tonight we're not going to discuss that in detail, but that's just my opinion on this matter of tithes and offering. I mean, I know there are many genuine preachers out there who do their best. But in the matters of the spiritual world, sometimes your best is not good enough. You have to deliver the goods. If I go to work for a large company and I say I'm, I'm an engineer, and I cannot create the parts or create the workload, I will be fired. The spiritual world is much more dangerous, to say the least. <clears throat> so on the topic of faith, come closer. Come, come sit here so we can hear you and see you. Come 
She looked nice with a hat. Come have a seat. Doesn't she look nice, Sister Leela? With that hat. So, on the topic of faith, we want to know how does faith work? And what are the mechanics involved? And why our knowledge of faith thus far does not work for us? That out of the hundred people that is praying, only one person receives an answer. Hmm. That's a very interesting question. We mentioned earlier the placebo effect. And here we're going to reveal some of the common parlor tricks according to my dad. My father might not have been the most educated man, but he said something many, many years ago, I was a young guy, and he said, you know, if you have a hundred people in a crowd, five might have back pain, 10 might have arthritis, two of them barely might be giving problem that same day, somebody back damage, somebody shoulder hurting, get a sleep bag. It is the law of probability. Sometime a preacher go and he stand up in a crowd and say there's somebody with pain in your back. You have arthritis, you have diabetes. Well, a person who never went to church and is in the rum shop could have give you a more accurate description. The fact of the matter is. And some of us are so gullible to find God and find the truth, we are taken for a ride. And sometimes the placebo effect takes place. <clears throat> because you're so wanting to be healed, you feel special. And your faith, or placebo effect, you get healed. Does that make sense, Nala? Have you seen it? And many times people go to church, and, and in churches, this is a common practice. I'm not attacking the churches. Mind you, the church is there for the will of God. I'm not even attacking the preachers that does this. I'm saying come out of the nonsense and the, the willingly ignorant of the facts. And deal with things for what they are. If you really that good, look at them and tell them what's happening. Then we can know it's the spirit of God and not psychology. Am I making sense, sister? This is going to offend a lot of people, not so. But is it the truth? And that's why when we go to Hindus and Muslim and backsliders, as we call them, it's difficult because they look at you and say, well, like I would have said, you must be delusional. We said, we pray now and one out of a hundred happens to you, just like the lotto. We have to understand management at the highest level. Governments and institutions, they prey on these facts. For example, all over the world, you have a million people, but a case of two people want to be neutered gender. They have no gender, male or female, and they make a law. And then they say, we elect them there, we, they make that law on our behalf. But out of a million people, only 10 people might say, yeah, we agree with that, or we want to be that way. But this is how people are managed and run by government and institutions. Like the lotto, everybody wants to buy the lotto. In Trinidad, they say, many times the government rig it. We don't know that for sure. But we all have hope. The same thing in the church, we have hope that we might have a miracle. And sometimes we can induce our own miracle through placebo effect. But the question, the real question is how does faith work? This is the new year. And many of us are going to make resolution that last a week, or two weeks. Some might make it the month. And then we're back to square one. But what we want to do is make things happen in 2019. So how does faith work? Anybody know that scripture that described faith? Hebrews 11.1. Now, I'm going to try to demonstrate how that works. 
Faith is the substance. Substance is something tangible. My table is empty. Can you see the table here in front of me? Mm -hmm. I am believing God for a wallet with money. To have faith to make that happen or a packet with money. There's a process to make things happen. Like how did the dog get healed? We're going to just introduce it tonight. There's so many facets to it. But I'm going to give it a gist of it. How do I pray for people over the phone and they get healed instantly? What is that work? I'm going to try my best to give you the main ingredients. Many times we go to church and I want somebody to tell me what this means. And the, the scripture, it is written that where two and three are guarded in my name, what will happen? What does that mean where two and three are guarded in my name? You're smiling, help me. You heard it already, so help me. We can take on the thing. Let, 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 let it be seen. No, as, tell us. As we grew up, we learned two and three is like one, two, three. However, we are one, two, three. Spirit, soul, and body. Two and three are God within us. We are God. So, the first thing you have to do when you want to act in faith, Jesus said, touching anything, if two and three are God in my name, if you have faith and believe, you can see this mountain. Be removed and cast into the sea. It's not so simple. What it means is that your spirit, your soul, the carnal man, must come in unison. And then the body will follow. But how does it work? 99 if not a hundred percent of the people looking at this when you're praying your mouth is saying hallelujah 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 your mind is saying i wonder what i'm cooking tomorrow morning your mouth and your spirit is saying lord i worship you the guy is thinking i wonder if i'll get a part tomorrow for the cowboy is that common mm -hmm. What it is, it is the carnal man and the spiritual man is continuously at war. Mm -hmm. And what Jesus was, and what the scripture is trying to tell us in code, are you enjoying this, brother? <laughs> First time you're hearing it that way. Well, that's why the Lord took me out of the, 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 the karaoke club. The spirit and the soul is continuously at war. And Paul tried to tell us in his writing, that the carnal man and the spiritual man must become one. When you want to see results in your prayer life, when you say hallelujah, your carnal man, your spirit, spiritual man must visualize that hallelujah going up to the throne of God. First step, in unison, the body, the third person will follow. And when you visualize that one hallelujah going up to God, you have to visualize the blessing coming down. That's the first step to begin to access the power that every one of you have. But it doesn't stop there. When the praises go up, the blessing come down, you have to learn to receive it. Now, faith works like this. The scripture, it is written, for the lack of knowledge, what happens? The people perish. But there's a sister scripture to that. Where there is no vision, the people perish. 
listen to this now so first you have to have the knowledge of what you're doing why you're doing it we're going to demonstrate hebrews 11 and 1 now faith is the substance of things hope for it's not there you're still hoping for it. You have the knowledge of what you're going to do. In your mind, you are visualizing, you are putting that there. The substance of things hoped for. It's not there yet. But in faith, you claim it. You are seeing it in faith. Even though the table is empty, you are seeing the wallet or the car or the baby. Or the finance. It's not there. You have the knowledge. Now you're putting the vision. You are creating the envision. So it's substance. It's tangible to you. You're feeling it in faith. Even though it's not there yet. So it's a substance of things. Hope for. It's not there. The evidence. Of things not yet seen. It's not there yet. But in your mind, you have a certain knowledge that whatsoever you ask in faith, believing of the Father, He will give it unto you because He wants your joy to be halfway. Is that true? No. He wants it to be why it is then that most of the people in the church are miserable and rhetorical i go to church i visit churches and how are you brother <laughs> blessed and highly favored really <laughs> can you pay your mortgage and go on a vacation next month no so how in the world are you blessed and highly favored you just cursed yourself when you are enjoying a lie by being rhetorical. Especially when a sinner God asks you, how are you? Is he blessed and highly favored? And you say, okay, you don't need a blessing. Because you're already blessed. In other words, your words. And this is, faith is a big thing. Are we going to demonstrate uh, as soon as we get the projector on the, by the 15th? I'm going to show you how your thoughts change the molecular structure of every liquid and solid. But it's just we don't have the device to show you how it changes the solid. Because we have to understand everything in the world, science will tell you everything is energy. Ready? This table is a collection, a condensation of density of energy we call it wood and we'll be going very deep into this subject down to the molecular structure the quantum physics and then we will bring it right back up to the human tangible facts and then we'll take it to the other dimension of the metaphysical and spiritual world this is not play church i'm not here to waste your time so when we say faith, we're going to make it happen. So, we're going to do an experiment again. Now, that dog was an experiment. Because all that we're talking, I can do all things to Christ that strengthened me. So, I shut the door because he killed 72 ducks. Those dogs destroyed 72 ducks, 24 expensive Rhode Island chicken and all my rabbits, 20 something of my daughter's rabbits. So those who might want, why I want to shoot a dog is because they were very destructive. I goes, you know what? I'll apply Moses' law to you all. Eye for eye. In this case, 20 duck for one dog. I'm just kidding. But only, yeah, they were pests or pets. Um, one other thing is, God was using this to show something and teach something. 
when I felt the hurt and disappointment in these two people here, I was like, Lord, what should I do? And, and when I used to hear people say God spoke to them, I used to say they really need a psychiatrist. They need medication. Now I'm the recipient of those if someone should choose to. However, I have evidence to support my conversations with my imaginary friends, as some in the scientific way we want to put it. So I said, well, what should I do? This young lady was there and he was hurt and disappointed. I said, Lord, let's do this. You do your thing. And for those who want to find out the science of how it works, I do have the ability to go in their world, what might be referred to as a metaphysical or the other dimension. And I told them they're forgiven. I looked at the dog this way, you're forgiven. By the time I looked at her, she was smiling and gobsmacked. Because the dog, like, the dog, like, he knew what's going to happen, so he couldn't wait to come out from the grass. And I never seen a dog walk his tail for four hours before in my life, but those who were here saw that. You know, so, but that, as I said, these things are not so fantastic. It's just what you can do when you know how fate works. So we're going to analyze it again. The substance, it's empty. When you pray for something, now don't be ridiculous and pray that God give you an airplane in the morning or a helicopter. You know, some people are, are really outrageous. And this is a new year coming, and for the young men and young women out there, don't say, Lord, send me a boyfriend or send me a girlfriend, and all you do is go home and go to church. Because a lot of you are going to get old in the church. You're not going to find a boyfriend or a girlfriend. If you want one who does drink rum, go to the club. If you want one who does good things, go visit charity group, do some good things. Go to the malls and pray to God. Have a cup of tea. You want a sophisticated person? Line where there is sophisticated people. You want a person who belongs to the loony bin? Go where there are people who look like they belong to the loony bin. And there are many places we can call, but we'd rather not tonight. I'm sure some of you are thinking of some places. <laughs> but you know, sometimes I see too many people going to church, but an oven. And they're asking God, Lord, I need a boyfriend. Lord, I need a girlfriend. The Lord sent a brother in the church. He said, hi, how are you doing, sister? And she goes, what's wrong with you? Hello. Yes, yeah, sister. Some of them order them high color. And another thing we have to understand when asking for things in faith, yeah, and big pockets. I used to be a lecturer, for those of you who know me. I'm teaching computer classes, and sometimes the class finish early. And this is from experience I'm talking. This is a new year. A lot of people are going to be making a lot of resolutions. And some of them will be a, a partner in life. I met a girl who was this size. Don't care for her, but she has a very beautiful heart. And she said to me, Mr. Turbani, I am the best woman out here if only a boy could look at my heart you know this is the best woman in the whole of Trinidad I love him I'll cook I'll do everything I'll work we'll share all these things it was very difficult for me to tell her honey he not going to see your heart through all that fact <laughs> young girl 18 years old She was the most wonderful person. I knew her personally. How do you tell somebody, listen, but you want a fella, muscular, well-built, slim, tall, dark, and handsome, and fat wallet according to him. If you want them looking like that, you have to look like that. The first rule in seeking relationships, for those of you who will be looking is, when you say you want a man or a woman, you must first ask, what am I bringing to the table? What do you have to offer? 
Human beings, they don't see your heart when they see you. They see your face first. And then they look at your other body parts. If you're like me and you have a big belly, don't go looking for a slim young girl. You have to be delusional, to say the least, unless your bank account is very big and you're very delusional. Now, I might offend some people. My intention is not to offend anyone. My intention is to tell you the truth, to help you have a better, more successful life. So when you want things in faith, don't go, you're not going to the gym, you're not dieting, you're eating ice cream every day because of depression and frustration. You're gaining weight and say, Lord, I want somebody looking like Matt. Tall, dark, and handsome, well built. How tall are you, Mark? Six feet? Six plus. Six plus? How, how heavy are you? <laughs> so, I guess it's 184 compact built, six feet plus. <laughs> but you want to eat ice cream and burger every evening. But you want Mark. It wouldn't work, people. When you want to have faith, you eat ice cream every evening, call Jerry, he will join you. Even though he's Muslim. I mean, we got to be realistic. I mean, this is a problem all over the world in the church. This is New Year's. We're going to have resolution. How is faith? How does it work? Am I making any sense, brother? Yeah, yeah. So the first thing you have to understand faith, you have to have knowledge how it works. What are you praying for? You had a question earlier. Why is it God won't answer your prayer sometimes? Now, you had a couple of miracles and you have one or two you're waiting on. Sometimes, a lot of us need to find out what is the will of God for our lives. And if you research the scripture, you'll find even the saints were praying for Paul one time. And they had to give up praying because then they accepted that God will not answer our prayer because it is not in his will for Paul. Sometimes we pray and we pray amiss. But one of some of the major problems I'm seeing in the church, and this is our first time, but I'm, I'm saying it up front. And this is a new year. A lot of young men and young women are going to say, this year I want to find my other half. All over the world, not just in Trinidad. What are you bringing to the table? If you want somebody who is wealthy, do you have the knowledge to manage well? You want somebody who is fit and athletic. Are you fit and athletic? These are simple, basic questions we, the church, need to tell our people. Some of us say, I want to be great in God. Have you studied the word? So getting back to faith, how it works. We must have the knowledge in whatever we do. If you want to pray for something, Somebody will say, I want a job as a manager. Or I want to start my own business. The first thing you have to do, if you look throughout the Bible, it's knowledge-based. God says very plain, not that anybody's foolish. Nobody's foolish. But we sometimes act foolishly. And God does not honor you when you act foolishly. Because you have to understand, everybody is fulfilling a certain purpose and plan under the will of God. So first get your knowledge of what you want. In your case, you know you want a certain business. You already have your knowledge of how it's going to work. So what you need to do, and we have to understand how God works in making things happen. And I'm going to share this at the same time. Everything you see is the handiwork of God, yes? It's part of God. God is said to be omni what? That means everywhere you look, you see God. So God is literally the universe. Is that correct? If God is the universe and everything in it, when you pray, you have the power and authority vested in you because you can do all things to Christ to strengthen you. You don't go to ask God to do it. This is where we have the problem. Some of us say, God, I want you to send our boy. 
Yes, he have some in San Fernando, the tighter boots. You know the boy that they, they use as an anchor for the boots? Yeah. Because you're saying, God sent me a boy. God didn't say that. He said, he gave you the power. He said, you can do all things. So why ask God to do So you have to say, Lord, from around the universe, I call my other half to me. Let him come. Let him find me. I will find him. But when you pray, pray once, not like the heathens, the scriptures say, a hundred times. And then thank God after and look out for that opportunity. You see, when they talk about the dog, I never even turned back from the hammock, as he said. I never even looked at them or the dog. The only time I looked the dog direction is when I said, you guys are forgiven. And still I didn't look back, even when she was... <laughs> When they got all excited, then I turned. Why didn't I turn before? This is not to lift me up. I'm the most unworthy person God could find to teach you today. If I had my way, I'd be having a nice shot of scotch this evening, celebrating the old years. But my life is no longer mine, but it's dedicated to God and you. So I'm the most unworthy person, as I explain all the time. But why didn't I look back? Why only look when everybody got excited and I had to turn? Because when you believe, you are commanding the universe to act. You can do it. You don't need to look. Because that's doubting. As I said, I don't believe in God. Mm. I stopped believing in God a long time ago. When you have a relationship with somebody, you don't believe in them. You get to know them. Too many Christians believing in God. No. Quote that scripture again. They that know their God. That's right. That's right. When you believe, it's because you doubt. You question. So I'm asking you and those of you in the video to stop believing in God. Get to know Him. And in faith, you can do this. Those of you who are here, you know. Again, Mark. And if Paulette was here, she'd tell you she had had, she have had her encounter with angels. When you reach out to the universe and to God, he's constantly reaching out to you. You all will have your experiences. God is constantly reaching out. The angels of God is reaching out. But because we have blocked him, not because we don't have faith, but we Put our faith in a different direction. We believe he exists. We don't want to know him. We come back to answering the question again. How does it go? The mechanics of it? The mechanics of faith is simple. Well, for some of us. <laughs> We're going to do it again. I want you to learn it. There is no wallet here. There is no car in my parking lot. So this will symbolize a brand new car. Albert, if you're watching, this is your car. Faith is the substance. It means in your mind, you create it. You materialize it and you put it there. Hope for it's not there yet. But you're seeing it. anybody else look they can't see it because it's not there yet you are seeing it as evidence when you walk out in your yard in the morning you're seeing that new car nobody else is seeing it but you're seeing it so you're not asking for it again you're saying Lord thank you that paint job looks so good
follow me there, brother? Does it make sense? Are you having fun? <laughs> so this year, when you want to get that boyfriend, that girlfriend, that new car, that finances, when you go to prayer tonight, You first have to learn how to pray, how to make this happen. The scripture says, or it is written in the scripture rather, come before his presence with praise and thanksgiving. Enter his courts with praise and thanksgiving. And come boldly before the throne of grace. In the year 2019, I want to tell you, you are not sinners. And this will sound even more strange. You're not a sinner, brother. You're not a sinner, sister. If the price was paid for me to sit at this table with a meal that is to be set before I come, I don't need to come with money. It's already paid. One has to examine, examine the scriptures that says, he answer your prayer before you even ask why but I'll tell you what the devil will tell you you are a sinner you are unworthy <clears throat> is that true then we sing amazing grace and we feel more unworthy the man who wrote amazing grace was a murderer and a killer his own Sailors tried to kill him with the anchor. But all this is part of the device to divide and conquer. To conquer you, the church through the ages has used subtle methods to make you feel unworthy so they can manage you and control you. It's like for those who have abusive husbands and boyfriends or abusive girlfriends, the strategy will be to make you feel you're not worthy of them. They will tell you all manner of terrible things. Make you feel less than so they can manipulate you and control you. They just do it in a smaller scale than the devil has entered in the church and done to thousands of people. Am I making any sense to you? And this is a very, very troubling thing in the church. I'm not here to preach to Hindus or Muslims because I think the church needs to be saved from themselves. But that's a topic for another day. So when you go to pray, go boldly before the throne of grace, remembering that everything you're ever going to do in your life was written before you were born. In the scripture, it's written that in the ancient of days, he written he write it. You remember that experience you have? Deja vu. Can you tell us how that works? And tell me why you think you have deja vu. It's just something like you're going through uh, the general process of the day or the reason like this organization we have here right now. And like everything for the split second you can recall that you've been seeing it already. Like it happened already in your mind. So I was I always tell my husband, say, um, I dreamed this, I saw this already, but you told me otherwise. <laughs> well, some people in the ancient days, the Jews believed that before you would die, Michael the Archangel took you to a high mountain. And in that high mountain, he showed you your entire life. The family you're going to be born in and everything else is going to happen. And when I died in my motorbike accident, I studied a lot of different religion and concepts and, you know, to figure out what happened to me. And I've had many deja vu experience. I well, how does that work? And that was the best explanation I found because what it says is when you study from a scientific approach, that when you and my death experience where I left and I come back and I know how when you die all things come to memory and when you're coming back to this body it's erased well most of it 98 percent 
I can understand how the deja vu works because I know what it is. Everything is, is, is supposed to be erased, but there are sometimes glitches in the system. And you can tell down to the microsecond what's going to happen exact. And that ties in with forgive your brother 70 plus 7 times a day. Because what the Lord was trying to listen, he's not really sinning against you. He's just fulfilling the purpose for which he was created. And if people understand that, they will have such a better life. Less hate. Because you don't have time to hate. You understand what it means that to put on the helmet of salvation. Because, yes, John can be an idiot. Harry can be worse, but they're only fulfilling what it was written for them. They're not really doing it against me. And that's why Jesus could say, Father, forgive them. Because it was removed from the memory that they had written in it. For they knew not what they do. You know, it, it all ties in with faith and how things work. Do you understand the mechanics? Can you tell us how it works? Huh? Is there any other part? Oh, that thing. Anybody have any questions on faith and how it works? Um, on faith, right? I've prayed for certain things that have happened instantly. Right. But then again, I've prayed for certain things and it has not happened yet. And it seems like... Whether it will happen or not. Yes. Now, we, we, we referred to it earlier when we talked about Paul. Paul said to God, listen, Lord, I pray for so many things and it happened. And I'm praying for this thorn in my side. Now, I have plenty. And God told him, listen, my grace is sufficient. In life, we have to understand, and we will cover this in later months, some things wouldn't change. Because you have to ask the big question, why are you here? Why are you in this body? What is the purpose of your life? And this is a question every person asks. Many religions ask this question. Why are we here? What's the purpose? Some people get very brilliant and they say your purpose is to leave heaven where you worship God and then come on earth and worship God every day. They are a special kind of brilliant. You call them a zebra. zebra. How does that make any sense? But the reason sometimes our prayers will not be answered at this point in time, because you have lessons to learn. If I can tell you one thing in life, it will be this. All things all things are in preparation for things to come. I'm going to say it again. All things that you face in life are in preparation for things to come. Some people quote it different. They say, all things work together for the good to them that love the Lord. Sometimes we have to question how that works. But it almost means the same thing. Any other questions on faith? Everybody know how faith works? They can make it work? Knowledge first, then have the vision. Brother? So the first thing you have to have is knowledge. Vision. So you have to have the knowledge what you want. Something plausible. Don't be a car driver and tell the Lord you want a truck. And you don't know how to drive a truck. Go and learn to drive a truck first. Like Roger, right? That? Don't be a mechanic in a garage and say, Lord, I want to be a professor of science. Do you notice why a lot of people's prayers are not answered? 
They ask the impossible. But sometimes people get the impossible. In strange cases. So, you know, but things are written to happen. And, and try and figure out what is God's will for your life. And you all know me. If you come in front of a proper man of God, he'll look at you and he just tell you God's purpose in your life. But those are people with certain gifts. Not every prophet or every minister can do that. You know, but you all are blessed and lucky to have somebody who can help you with that. You know. Could you explain um, when they say you have faith as a mustard seed, you can get the mountain, you can tell the mountain moves. Explain that. Very good. Remember what we were saying, how faith works and how you get the job done. You just need to have a very little faith, but you have to have the unison where two and three are guarded in my name. When your spirit, the spiritual man and the carnal man can close your eyes and join in agreement and say, Lord, by the power vested in me, I command that mountain to be removed. Without the spiritual man saying that and the carnal man asking you, like you're yeah, a special kind of stupid or crazy or what? You know, sometimes we're praying and one, the voice saying, Lord, I want a new car. Here the carnal man. Where you getting a new car? You can buy a Zabuka, you want a new car? We are constantly at war. Paul said. Once you get it like a mustard seed, in fact, there are some things I'll teach in later lessons that will blow your mind on how to make things happen and materialize it. But this is the first stage. We're going to now move from milk and we're going to begin to go into meat. And then from meat, we're going to go into bones. Well, you wouldn't ask that question because you'll understand the first thing you have to do is two and three. Yes, you'll be demonstrating it. So the most difficult thing for 2019, make it your... No, this is easy to say, but very difficult to do. Even for me. Even though I can do certain things. Getting the spiritual man and the carnal man to come into one agreement. I'll tell you what happens. I will be thinking something. And when you speak, the process it takes for your brain to generate that, that word and come and comes out of your mouth, you get distracted. So most of the time, if you see me in church praying, you might not even see my lips moving. <laughs> You'll have all the noise around me, but I will go back to that place that I went where when I died and I'll stand in the presence of God and it might be for short periods of time but I'll get through where the body, the soul and the spirit is in oneness not for long somebody has 5 seconds, 10 seconds, 15 seconds but it's something you need to practice if you want to see miracles in your life if I can only get seconds in, seconds, not minutes. The only time I get, not even my whole minutes, when I'm home alone, and two, three o'clock in the morning, there's hardly any noise, I can get lost in that place of meditation where I'm in the presence of God and my body, my soul, and my spirit is in oneness. Once you do that, you get the mustard seed. That is the mustard seed. If you can have just so little bit, but the knowledge is important. With the knowledge, you put the vision, you visualize it, and it'll work. Yeah, I, I want to know, like, um, okay, right? I'm not um, too long in this church, you know, but I'll spray a lot, right? And uh, it's our people in England who I, I, I know, right? Never talk to them, but people sh just show me the pity and tell me they're affiliated with this person. And she can't hear, right? And I pray, and the the the, the girl, the lady sat here, and the one that was paralyzed had to walk. But yet, my mother right next door, 
and I'm touching she and I'm praying and, and nothing is nothing gonna happen. Now, two things. We had a bit of this discussion. One, you had a breakthrough. So before we go there, I want you to tell me and tell the people who's listening what happened, that what caused that breakthrough. Breakthrough? Oh yeah, Remember? I was yeah, mm -hmm. I I was like a, I was broken. Let them get the camera. We want to see you. Yeah. I went through a serious situation, right? And I was like broken. I had I had um no nowhere to go but to like to go to the Lord. Right? And I I, I used to lock in a room and just pray and pray and pray till you get till you can't pray, till you're silent. Right? And um praying, praying, praying. I want to challenge God. I want to see what happening. Right? So I start to like put out my hands. Right? And it started if this I start to I said the Lord, if you exist, I need to know, right? But I could see nothing but I start to feel my fingers tingling. Right? Mm -hmm. And then I start to like pray and I start to see it more. But what I just do, I just this is my little thing, right? What and it's working. I just like look up into the sky and like see I packed in the cloud and see like a ray coming down. I just see it. And when I pray in, like my hands just be with energy. I just be energy. It comes so much twice I had to come out of the room because it was so much I don't know because that's all I know, right? But like when I when I pray in, I could see the mountains, I could see the ripple in the water because I just it's more than imagine. You visualize things. it. I just visualize it, right? So when I pray into these people and I'm, I just lock myself in the room and I just end up crying as be silent and I just feel like, the, well, the, the first they tell me that lady foot, right? But she couldn't walk, she paralyzed and I could feel like she, she ribs. I could see she ribs, right? Like an extra and I could, do, I could do it like this and I could feel everything in she's spine. Right? Alright, and I was like, and that was it for the for that lady, right? And she I tell you she could walk for Christmas. She went for Christmas, she went to the grocery, she was she was already sitting down, and then how one of them used to be texting, but she couldn't hear. Right? And I and, and I just like picture it and I just like seeing the red spot like a bl like a blinkers and I seen the spot and I pray for it and I pray for it and I like more silent and crying with emotion and that was it yeah but oh. i do the same thing with my mother Another and mother. my hands actually the energy I, you know oh. and like and like praying and like touching this lady for i say lord she need to walk she need to walk and like praying praying and nothing we're gonna touch on that you know uh -huh. we're gonna run the time quick uh -huh. we're gonna touch on that one of the key things is and you said the words you visualize it it's a vision but one of the things to make faith work and people have to understand this is a thing called emotion throughout the scriptures you will find that god reacted more and is in touch with your emotion if you recall of all the people he said don't offend is the widow and the fatherless. Anybody ever ask why? Because, because of the emotion and the cries of the heart, they are ever before the presence of God. Mm -hmm. When you go before him with a broken spirit and a contrite heart, in other words, when you want to get in the presence of God, the deep Quiet into the deep from the sound of the vortex. And if anybody know what is that vortex, when you look in the sea, you'll see a whirlwind. And that go way down to the bottom and it'll suck from the sun, come up and go straight up to the clouds. So when you cry from deep within the inner recesses of your soul, that emotion sends it all the way to heaven. You see, these things we're going to explore in detail and further thing, how it works. But your emotion is a very, very powerful, powerful key to opening the spiritual realm for results. 
or reaching the heart of God. So you have gone into certain thresholds unknowingly by using the right method to approach it. You see, if you look at all the stories in the Bible, the woman crying or and they thought she was drunk, she was moaning and groaning, and even the priest thought, why this woman drunk? It was emotion. The woman who touches garments, she was emotional. She said to herself, nobody wants me. If I could just touch his garments. We're going to deal with these things, but intent is very important with emotion. And all this is attributes to how you make faith, faith works. Now, the question with your mother, and this is very, very interesting. So, a lot of times we see it in church, the pastor can pray for other people, they get healed. His wife gets sick, she goes to the hospital, she dies. Or she goes for a heart attack, she goes for an operation. Or the pastor himself. How does it work? We have a few minutes, so we're going to cover this very quickly. How many of you believe Jesus was God in the flesh? Please, show me your hands. Everybody will agree yes. unanimously, God, Jesus was God in the flesh. And we'll go with the scripture in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. At a later time, we'll discuss that at a different level, but Jesus was God in the flesh, and this is true. How it is God in the flesh could not do any great miracles when he went to Nazareth. <laughs> Brother, help me with that. You've been in church too many years. You never heard that question before. Oh boy, don't worry, there's a few hundred thousand like you, if not millions. How it is Jesus, who is God in the flesh, could not perform any mighty miracles? And the scriptures tell you in milk level because the people believe not. It's not that they did not believe. There are two things at work. One, the emotions. We will deal later on, and those of you who want to see it in front, look at how your emotion changed the molecular structure of water. Two, he was there, but they believed God was up there. Your thoughts and your belief or unbelief can render the hand of God tied, if not almost powerless. Now think about it. If this is God Almighty in the flesh, how can he not do miracles? All these will be exploring more detail, but I'm just tonight as introduction. But I said we are not going to be dealing with milk for those of you who want to follow us. The question we ask, do not ask your pastor, you'll put the poor guy in a bad shape. Some of them, most of them. How could God not do miracles? Because the people, your thought and your belief system is so powerful, it affects the atmosphere around you. And when you do that collectively as a body of people, you can stop the very hand of God as evidence. So if your mother does not believe you have that capability, my friend, she herself stopped the hand of God from working. Does that help you understand what happened? Yeah, yeah. And this is the thing... You have to understand all the dynamics of how the spiritual realm works, how the energy works, how it flows. And when you understand this fully, then you will understand when I say healing is not a miracle. You can do it at will. But for the time being, I'm told I have to say it's a miracle. So healing is a miracle. I bow for now until you all will tell me, Pastor, that's true. Healing is not really a miracle. We can do that thing in our sleep. 
when you understand the principles, everything in the universe works by cause and effect. Everything comes down to almost a mathematical equation. God is not like us, vaiky vaik. He works by order. So those of you who want to understand God in 2019, you want miracles. Understand when you pray, first thing you got to do is get knowledge. What you want, how it's going to work. Remember, faith is the substance of things hoped for. You are seeing it there. You are seeing the car in your garage, even though everybody is seeing the garage empty. Substance hoped for is yet to come, but you make it into solid substance already. Evidence in your mind, in your heart, in your emotion, you are not asking for it anymore. You are thanking God for it. As though it is there already, it's the evidence of things not yet seen. Do we understand that, Mark? So if you want a new garage, whatever you want, in 2019, you go home, you take a shower tomorrow morning, and you tell the devil, listen, mister, we are going to party because I have a special stick to beat you with in 2019. <laughs> if you are a hunter, I have a special gun I'm going to shoot you with in 2019. Because brother, all that doubt and nonsense you've been giving me for all these years, you're going to be hiking up the road. Because I can see you hiking up the road. <laughs> And later on, we're going to discuss things like what is trials and tribulation? Is it real? Or is it a construct of the mind and the consciousness? Or is it how you perceive things? Is it prosecution? Or is it only your perception? Would you all like to learn this later on? Does it sound interesting or it's going to be yeah, boring? Yeah. No, no. I have to know. If it's boring, we're just going to, you know, meet and cook a duck or some wild meat and, and just have a, a normal 4-H club. <laughs> just a, is this interesting? Was it worth the curtains? <laughs> <laughs> have you learned anything tonight? Will you invite your friends to share this video so that they can learn and benefit? Have I answered your question on faith? How it works, at least the mechanics. Give me more, a few more, but yeah. <laughs> I'll give you a few more. Yeah. Have extra, okay. <laughs> Anybody have any other questions before we finish in 15 minutes? Brother, your first time I'm meeting you. First time actually I feel like yeah, somebody talking something I tell us so honestly somebody talking something that can hit me in the heart and I'm blessed honestly I'm blessed so you'll be you'll be working yeah, to, I'll, to, I'll be yes yes except for the so we have to decide what day is a good day to have service this is our first time and, and this service was promised because in me trying to run from God, I told somebody, I said, listen, I'd rather go and drink rum than go and preach. And the reply was, well, pastor, if you go in the rum shop, we come in there and you got to preach to me. I said, okay. And I had a feeling they weren't bluffing. So I goes, Lord, you're really serious about this, aren't you? And then God decided to just do miracles upon miracles. And I have to, out of respect and integrity for or you have to honor when you see God is working in a way that my mind cannot explain because that's the deal I made with him. If I can explain it, you're on your own partner. You come and do it yourself. Because there's too many two by four 
fly by night, people clinging to the men of God. And I make no apologies in saying this. They're charlatans, they're just looking to fool people for the fame and the money because in the real world they can't make it, brother. <laughs> in the secular world they can't even hold a job. They have no honor because they haven't earned it. But in the world of illusion and delusion, there are kings on a throne. Unfortunately, that's the state our church has come to. Sad to say. But it's up to you and I, and it has fallen upon me, not by choice, but by the pure will of God. You know me, I was the worst. Yeah. I ran, I did everything <laughs> I could possibly do that God will not choose me. I thought I was doing a really good job. He cannot choose me. I break all the rules. I'm making sure I'm crossing them off one by one. So Lord, I'm the last person. So most likely if all the preachers die, then you will say, hmm, there's that no good son of mine. Unfortunately, the Lord said, ah, no, he wasn't running. I was preparing him. I thought, oh boy, what a luck. So now I have my cross and my thorn on the side to carry a spore. <coughs> but when I see the things we have seen, and for those of you listening, we have so much more amazing miracles to tell. We have people healed over the phone. People healed, not even meeting them from cancer. We have a doctor who is healed. But I'll let him testify. You guys will go with the phone and... You'll meet his wife. I have never met his wife yet. I've known her very well for two years. And I was testing this thing. And I'll share this testimony before we go. So I said, Lord, this is just all in the minds. This is not possible. So I decided to test this ability God gave you to see the past, the present, and the future. So I told this woman things about her and people she know that I haven't met. Two years in advance, and I give a date some time, what's going to happen? So I thought I had a foolproof way of getting out of this, because that's just impossible. You cannot do that. And that didn't go as planned. Her husband got sick. He was healed over the phone while I was having a drink from an aneurysm that burst. That, you all will go and get a testimony and post it online. Over the phone. Just like you, I'll go and I'll see it. Hmm. And then she was healed because she was a medium. She had some problem, but you all get that on testimony. But the ability to see the future is impossible as far as I'm concerned. It's just, I'm now right smack in the middle of it. And that and all the other things have caused me, my brother, to be in ministry now. Today being the first day. And it's a start to a new journey where you will explore secrets and mysteries that you have never heard before. And I'm sure you've never heard it before because some of it was only revealed to me by standing in the presence of God. And I'll share next time my testimony of dying in a motorbike accident and going before God and seeing the throne and seeing Christ sitting on the throne, seeing the streets of gold and seeing the mansions of pearl and just because we have a few minutes, I'll give you a brief run for those of you online. And when you die, Sister Leela, the Mansion of Pearl is a three-story building. Big like this, the whole length. About 100 feet long, 50 feet wide. Three stories. I, being in the building industry for over 30-something years, I can tell you, that building is carved out of one single pearl. Each building, most beautiful building. The streets are made of gold poured as though it poured, and big, huge junks of nuggets like this that you'll be walking on. The saints of God will be singing that song that we will sing every time we have service. When I pray and I go before the presence, I'll sing that song with them, and they sing, Holy, Holy, Holy. Worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lamb which was and is and is to come. Glory, glory, glory. Hallelujah. 
and lead him and lead him and he'll worship him that sits on the throne and even in my changed transformed body I could not look upon that throne to see him who is brighter than ten suns and he was the light of the city and for those of you who are into science that city is located in that place called Orion's Belt because when you die you don't lose consciousness I was very much aware of everything as the car ran into me and I start traveling I was very much aware of everything but when you go out where they say there's a bright light it's not a bright light at the end of the tunnel the other side is so bright it looked like a bright light being a young man growing up like any young man in those days you go all over the world you enjoy looking at beautiful women the creatures I saw they are the most beautiful beings I've ever laid eyes on yes mark they have golden hair the most beautiful skin and they radiated it's the most beautiful sight you'll ever see on earth we can get so happy sometimes that our body in church sometimes we cry with joy and want to explode we can't contain it but there's one little spot in our heart that's empty when you go and you cross that threshold of the end of the tunnel where the light is the joy will start from that little spot and it will radiate through your body and you will glow and you will become like a light you will radiate and some of the things for you to understand what you're going through in life is when you go there how you have done on earth determines how bright you will shine and radiate that's why Paul said he welcomed trials and tribulations he welcomed the preparation process because when he overcome them and he goes back he said henceforth now is laid up for me a crown of righteousness but he didn't give you all the details so when you're going through a hard time and Paul told you to rejoice he was trying to tell you why you're going through a hard time because the more trials and tribulations you go through the more you're going to shine and radiate that light of God and we're going to have more questions and answers what day is good for you all is it a Sunday three days <laughs> next three days three days for the week Let me see if you got how many days you say? <laughs> Three days for the week. Would you be able to remember this is well we have to hear your testimony first. Yes. Because you never wanted to go to church, but we know you have a powerful, powerful testimony. But I want people to I want you to grasp what I'm saying. Because when I cross one topic, I will not come back to it. Because I wanted to take you from milk to meat and then to bone, to understand the mysteries hidden in plain sight. We're going to be discussing things like Adam and you, are you related? And nobody here is related to Adam. How is that possible? We're going to be discussing things like who was in the land of Nod that Cain found his wife. We're going to be discussing things like the pyramids, aliens, the different races, who made you, where you come from, why are you here, what's your purpose on earth? When he say he's king of kings and lord of lords, who is these other kings? Who is these other lords? These are just some of the things we're going to be discussing. So we can't have a three days. Your brain will not function too well <laughs> to digest all of that in such um, short spaces. Yes. I, I'm, preachers tell me their brain get fried, so I don't know. When I talk to them, they say, Pastor, you fry my brain. I go, no, I didn't. 
You just didn't spend time studying and you went to preach. So what's a good day? Sunday evening is good for most people? Sunday five o'clock is good, six o'clock? Five is good, so Monday is a working day? Yeah? yeah? One day for a week for now. We have so much to think. And we're taping it so you can always look back at the tape, you know, and recount and recollect. So what we're going to do is break up the tape and put it on YouTube in different parts. So you can share with people. And any question you have under the sun, don't be afraid to bring it. It's not witchcraft to ask questions. It's ignorance to say it's witchcraft. And any preacher who tells you you ask a question is witchcraft, he needs to get his act together and get his butt into Bible school and start studying. Because it means he lacks knowledge. And when the people lack knowledge, what happened, brother? They perish. And we don't want you guys perishing. And we are open to Hindu, Muslim, Christian, non-Christian for any questions. We have two minutes left. I want somebody to, to, to lead us in prayer. Who wants to close us in prayer? How do you feel about that? Then? Well, we have you, we have you. Let us all pray then. Um, you want some nice music, musician? I want you to think. Young man, what's your name again? Joe. Joe, come sit down here and, and, and hold your brother's hand and let's let's pray. I want two of you to close this in prayer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. Praise you. Glorify your name, O God. Hallelujah. And Father Lord, as we approach your throne of grace, there's no other name but the name of the Son Jesus. This evening, O God. Father, we give you the thanks, Lord. We give you the glory. We give you the honor, Lord, for the opportunity, O Lord, that we have, O Lord, to come to listen and to understand the mystery of your words, O Father God, and to, to, to absorb what your man of God have to say unto us, O Father God. And as we hear, O Lord, at a collective unit and a collective gathering, O Father God, I ask you, O Father God, that you're going to bless the man of God, O oh Father yes, God. Lord. Yes, Lord. Lord, you know what you, he asks you for, O oh Father God. Hallelujah. Lord, I thank you, Father God, for what you're about to give unto him, O oh Lord Jesus. Jesus. And Father Lord, I lift up every single one of us uh, here, O oh God. As we approach the new year, O oh Father God, it is a new journey we are stepping into, O oh Father, O oh Lord, a new year. Yes, Lord. And Jesus, we ask you, oh, no, 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 not to hold back any good thing from us, O oh God. Lord, all of us have things that we are asked of you, O oh Father God, Lord, and we thank you once more for it. And we will be keep on thanking you, O oh Father oh Jesus. Father, give you glory, we give you honor, we give you praise in no other name but the name of the Son, Jesus. I want to add to that prayer. Are we going to do something as we prayed earlier? And the economy is going down. I made a deal with God and I said, listen, if I'm going to minister for you, you have to back it up. If you don't back it up, you come and do this stuff yourself. I can't use the exact word I use because some of you wouldn't like it. So here what we're going to do. God said, try me now. Let's see if I'm not God. We have a depressed economy. Let's try God. Tomorrow is next year. And I'm saying, God, you're going to meet all our needs. Oh man, let's, pray. let's pray that and we're going to agree in oneness and this is how it's done if the people can agree that Jesus is not God and stop the hand of God we can agree and remove the hand of the devil so let's just play with the economy tonight hallelujah Lord we come in oneness as I stand before your holy throne of God again by the power vested in me of God from standing here in your throne I command a blessing upon everyone here financially in 2019 against every art so that they might know that you are God in your life and will stand in the congregation and say, truly, this is the Lord at work. I thank you for answering this prayer and meeting this need. And I speak to the universe right now to come alive and deliver work into the hearts and minds of men. To minister to everyone here financially in Jesus' name. Amen.
he said, prove me now. Thank you all for watching. We look forward to seeing you next week, Sunday, 5 o'clock.